survived. And as the story got around, the hospital where Talani worked, New York Presbyterian, decided to make a playlist that would help everyone remember the right CPR tempo. This is the first track by the Bee Gees. The songs really do help. If you sing Staying Alive, you know, you're going to be there. It's like, uh, 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 uh. That's it. That's the beat. That's how fast you want to go. We wanted them to be songs that people already knew by heart. Elena Patchouli works for Sidon Advertising and helped choose the songs. So that's why the the list is pretty varied. It's been to be clear, this is not a playlist to go running for if you see someone have a heart attack. It's just meant to keep that perfect CPR tempo fresh in your mind in case. Past studies have suggested that listening to music while doing CPR is not helpful. You know, if you can save somebody's life while humming Missy Elliott's Work It, then that's okay with us. <laughs> Right now, the playlist on Spotify has about 3,000 followers. They're considering updating it with the latest hits. Rebecca Hersher, NPR News. Support for your health comes from Home Instead Senior Care, providing help with bathing, medication reminders, and Alzheimer's and dementia care to keep seniors at home. Homeinstead.com slash NPR. This is NPR News. It is 7.30. This is WUSF 89.7. Would you attend college and seek a degree if you could only do it on weekends? We'll take a look at where this idea seems to be catching on coming up in about 15 minutes on Morning Edition. Support for WUSF comes from our members and Baycare. When Lakota Lockhart fell asleep, his breathing would stop. But he was treated at a rare place, Baycare St. Joseph's Children's Hospital. Today, Lakota is living a full life and fighting for children's health care rights. Watch his story at humanityatwork.org. Support also comes from the Fresh Market, celebrating 35 years of fresh foods with in-store sampling and events throughout the month of April. Details at thefreshmarket.com. 731, I'm Carson Cooper, WUSF 89.7 News. There was a bit of commotion outside a Wendy's fast food restaurant in Tampa over the weekend. As Rachel Iacobone reports, the coalition of Immokalee workers came calling. CIW has been in La Lucha for nearly a decade now. In the case of Wendy's, it's been even longer. That fight's been going on since 2005, when the Alliance for Fair Food first wrote a letter to Wendy's asking the company to join the fair food program to ensure humane wages and working conditions for those who pick its produce. There was no response, but annually and periodically we would call on them again to join. Meanwhile, four of their competitors have joined, McDonald's, Yum Brands, Burger King, and Subway leaving them as the odd person out. Even Chipotle has joined, for goodness sake. That's Reverend Noel D'Amico. Though the march began in front of a Publix, D'Amico says it's meant to engage Publix, not boycott the store. We have been calling on Publix quietly for a long time, but we opened a campaign in 2009, and we said explicitly that we needed them to come on board and ensure human rights in their own backyard. Wendy's officials would not do an interview. In a statement, Wendy's spokesperson Heidi Schauer said the fast food chain does not believe joining the fair food program is the only way to act responsibly. It believes in the goals of any organization that seeks to improve human rights, but does not believe in paying another company's employees. Tampa was the last stop on CIW's two-week Return to Human Rights tour, so for now, the group is back in Immokalee to prepare for the next round of the decade-long fight. I'm Rachel Iacoboni in Tampa. Breezy with a 20% chance for rain today, high 86. It's 732. I'm Julio Ochoa, editor of Health News Florida. Part of our job right now is to help you better understand common health care costs and procedures. We've created an interactive online site called Price Check. And in the next few weeks, we'll be talking with people just like you about your health care experiences. Our goal is to help others through your stories, both good and bad, about health care billing. Please be sure to contact us. To share your story, email us at pricecheck at wusf.org. Support for NPR comes from NPR member stations. 
and from Visit St. Pete Clearwater, home to White Sand Gulf Beaches 90 minutes west of Orlando, and Glass Art at the Chihuly Collection, now open in a new downtown St. Pete location. More at visitstpeteclearwater.com. From Cancer Treatment Centers of America, where teams of medical experts focus on the treatment of only one disease, cancer, every stage, every day. Learn more at cancercenter.com. And from the National Endowment for the Arts, Art Works. It's Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm Steve Inskeep. And I'm David Green. Let's just take a breath here and consider where things stand with all of these investigations into Russia, a country that intelligence officials believe tried to interfere in our country's presidential election. One of the big questions is what Michael Flynn knows. He's President Trump's former national security advisor, and he made this offer last week to testify about Russia if if he's granted immunity. Let's try and sort out where all of this goes next with NPR national security correspondent Mary Louise Kelly, who's in our studio. Mary Louise, good morning. Good morning, David. Let's start with this House investigation. They had the director of the FBI come testify. It seemed like they were making a whole lot of progress. Then they just descended into partisan bickering. Is that is that partisan bar brawl? Partisan bar brawl. Yeah. I mean, are, are, can that can that committee actually credibly get back on track? It is hard to see how they credibly get back on track and carry out an independent investigation at this point. They were supposed to hold another public hearing last week. The chairman, Devin Nunes, canceled that. It was supposed to be replaced by a classified hearing. That hasn't happened. And so far, there is nothing on the calendar this week. So we're at a point where the questions that the House committee is supposed to be investigating have been completely overtaken by questions about the committee about itself. The committee itself. Whether they can still ask, ask questions. Right. In particular, the questions about the chairman, Devin Nunes, whether perhaps he is too close to the White House to carry out an independent investigation. He denies that. And meanwhile, the White House is accusing the press and Democrats of creating a witch hunt atmosphere. So you have this, you know, again, you pick your metaphor, bar brawl, mess, paralysis mm -hmm. on the House side, which then raises the stakes for the two other investigations, which are creeping forward. Well, and you had Charlie Dent, a Republican from Pennsylvania, who, who said, you know what, this House investigation, it's just too partisan now. Let's turn the focus to the Senate. So the Senate is now investing. They held one hearing, but it, not a huge deal because it was mostly just getting academics to weigh in on, on Russia and what they might have done. You also have the FBI. I mean, it, just a lot of investigations. Uh, yes, exactly. Moving forward, I mean, the, we have less visibility into where the FBI is. Mm -hmm. um, they have announced, they have confirmed they are running a counterintelligence investigation into Russia and specifically into possible ties between people in Trump's orbit and Russia. Um, but exactly where they are in that investigation investigation we don't know I, I mean i will say in the service of tempering expectations we're in this for the long haul really? buckle up we johan can you hear me hey what's up man good morning i don't know how what time is it over there but um over here it's like 7 30 east coast <laughs> thanks for dropping by This guy doesn't like his fighters, dude. Our team has taken the lead. I feel bad for his fighters. did he survive? He got to four times. It's crazy.
Autopilot mode enabled. Group five, ready for takeoff. Autopilot mode disabled. Group five, airborne. Group two, approaching target. Group two, target destroyed. Group three, taking fire. Group Torpedoes to port. That was good. Note. There you go. <laughs> I just stopped it. I was waiting for it to go. But Ospina said she may have lost both her daughter and her husband. Experts say deforestation was a key factor in the catastrophe. People have cut down trees on nearby mountain slopes Ooh, and in river in watersheds. Like that. That's led to erosion and sedimentation in the this rivers, which has made the landslides worse. Macaw remains without electrical power or drinking water. Yep, but the government has like set up a command center in the around. town to coordinate tasks, such as food distribution and finding shelter for thousands of homeless people. During a Sunday visit to Mocoa, President Juan Manuel Santos outlined efforts to restore electricity, rebuild bridges, and to bring in more water tankers. He also promised rent subsidies for the homeless and said they would eventually receive new government-built houses. Santos said, we want to build a Makoa that's much better than it was before this disaster. From PR News, I'm John Otis in Bogota, Colombia. Later today, we go to Tijuana, Mexico. There's like a lot of people who just died over there. have had to move across the border outside the United States, leaving the country after their parents were deported. And this afternoon, and all things considered, we hear about a school program that helps them to adapt. <clears throat> this is NPR News. It is 741, and this is WUSF 89.7. I'm Carson Cooper. So would you attend college, seek a degree, if you could only do it on weekends? Too busy during the week? We'll, we'll take a look at where that idea is catching on in Florida coming up next on Morning Edition. Heading in on this Monday morning in Hillsborough County, that's where all the problems are, seem to be. Manhattan Avenue at Bay to Bay Boulevard, there's a crash. Also, US, US 301 southbound approaching Fowler Avenue. Slow on the Veterans Expressway southbound from Hillsborough Avenue down to 275, which is where the crash is on the shoulder there. And uh, slow on the Howard Franklin Bridge uh, heading northbound from the Pinellas side to uh, Tampa crash uh, has West Shore Boulevard, the uh, shoulder block there, and traffic comes to us from Total Traffic and Pet Supermarkets. This is Morning Edition on WSF 89.7. It's 742. From NPR News in Washington, I'm Dave Mattingly. A senior White House official is being accused of breaking federal law for criticizing a Republican congressman from Michigan on social media. Quinn Kleinfelter with member station WDET says the tweet urged voters to defeat the congressman in the state's next primary election. White House advisor Dan Scavino tweeted that Michigan's Justin Amash, a member of the House Freedom Caucus and frequent Trump critic, is a big liability and should be ousted from office. Some attorneys claim the tweet could violate regulations limiting how government officials can influence campaigns. But the White House says Scavino did not violate the law because he used a personal account, not an official one. The House Freedom Caucus is made up of conservatives who derailed efforts by President Trump and House GOP leaders to replace the Affordable Care Act. The University of South Carolina is celebrating its first championship in women's NCAA Division I basketball. NPR's Tom Goldman says the Gamecocks knocked off Mississippi State last night, 67-55. to The teams now have played three times this season. The Gamecocks won each contest. Yesterday, they were at their best on defense and offense. South Carolina star forward Asia Wilson had 23 points, 10 rebounds, 4 blocks, 2 steals. She was especially good in the fourth quarter as she repeatedly helped repel comeback attempts by Mississippi State. I'm Dave Mattingly, NPR News in Washington. There have been overtures from President Trump that he's getting 
fed up with the so-called Republican Freedom Caucus and may try to work a little harder with Democrats. So will that happen? And should Democrats work with him? We will take a look with Tom Ashbrook on points coming up this morning at 10. Support for WUSF comes from our members and Duke Energy providing grants and employee volunteer programs designed to strengthen the communities by helping local charities and outreach organizations. More information is at duke-energy.com slash community. The Foundation for a Healthy St. Petersburg harnesses the power of change, bringing the community together to support programs that optimize the health of all residents. You can learn more at healthystpete.foundation. A few things happening around the Bay Area today. A Tampa Bay Job and Career Fair is happening at the Coliseum in St. Pete today. U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky will appear tonight at the Palladium in St. Pete. TV's The Price is Right comes to Clearwater's Ruth Eckert Hall tonight and tomorrow night. Tampa Bay Rays began baseball season with a win, 7-3 over the Yankees. Game 2 is tomorrow night at Tropicana Field. And the Tampa Bay Lightning beat the Dallas Stars last night, 6-3. The Volts take on the Bruins tomorrow night in Boston. This is Morning Edition on WSF 89.7. It's 745. Support for NPR comes from NPR member stations. And from Carbonite for backing up and restoring office and home computers to the cloud automatically. Learn more at Carbonite.com. From Progressive Insurance with the Name Your Price tool, offering a range of coverage and price options to choose Sorry from. Sorry, guys. I'm now that's Progressive. Right now. More at Progressive.com or 1-800-PROGRESSIVE. And from American Jewish World Service, working for 30 years to end poverty and advance human Reading rights worldwide. Learn more at AJWS.org. Oh, Aopa here. It's 746. This is Morning Edition on WSF 89.7. Many of Florida's community colleges Dang, the fact that they are flexible, wow. offering late-night lectures, online classes, <laughs> and new he's programs a, to match every he's evolving very profession. Scared, dude. <laughs> but it's mainly he been a Monday already. through Friday be, thing. Oh, St. Fuck, St. Peter's College is trying out the idea of allowing Shit. students to They're pursue good. a degree They're entirely good. on Saturdays oh. and Sundays. And as Rowan Moore Garrity reports, the idea is catching on in South Florida. Yomaira Hidalgo used to take college classes three nights a week. In a word, she says, it was miserable. I mean, attending to your partner and the baby and trying to do homework, and it just it would, it wasn't happening. Her homework would just pile up all week long. Oh, I think you made the wrong turn. Can you hit him? Can you hit him? Each morning, driving oh, I hit him. And her son yes. They need to be. To get him up, like, hey, oh come on, gosh. take a shower. Then he takes 40 minutes in the shower. Oh, it's like, God you don't have that much body. Can you please? <sighs> Hidalgo is working towards an associate's degree so oh. she can become a crime scene investigator. But with yeah. weekdays that start that early and bunch, end right? late, she says. It makes sense for me to go do it on the weekends because it makes my schedule a little easier. Three quarters of our student population have the same issues. Efrain Venezuela is an associate dean who helped to oversee Miami-Dade's weekend college program. They have two jobs, they have a relative to take care of, both parents are working, they have children, they have uh, they're financially challenged at this point. They want something, they want to finish a degree, but unfortunately on, the they have the personal situations that preclude them from even to uh, be a regular, whatever you call regular, you know, day, uh, daytime student. They have to be evening and weekends. Weekday obligations are compounded time. by weekday traffic. So when you offer them the opportunity to say, listen, you, know, don't quit. you can finish up your only weekends, you're like, okay, that sounds cool. Certainly community colleges have fundamentally tried to organize themselves to be convenient. Tom Bailey directs the Community College Still Research Center at Columbia University. What's new about Weekend College at Miami-Dade is that financial aid, academic advising, and tutoring are all available on Saturdays, too. Bailey says that's crucial to helping weekend students succeed. And he says it hints at one reason we're starting to see similar programs. Oh, wow, no hits. Colleges nationwide. Oh, that's not good. The longer it takes for a student to finish, the less likely they are to finish. So how that's do you get busy good. people to enroll full time or keep that's the fine. students you already have you. from dropping out? If you have weekend college, you can keep your full time job. And that brings us to the second reason, which might be even more important. 
Community colleges nationwide saw a boom in enrollment during the recession, when full-time work was harder to come by. Now they're coping with a drop in new students as the labor market tightens. Weekend college is one possible solution to the squeeze. So it does take discipline to come to a school on a weekend. It does take a, a drive. Raul Corzo's finance class starts promptly at 8 a.m. on Saturdays. There are currently 2,100 students enrolled in weekend courses at this campus. Not all of them are full-time, but there are plans to expand the course offerings semester by semester. For the time being, students can earn a variety of associate's degrees or a bachelor's in business administration. All right, guys. Working in both formulas. Give me the results. Ashley Jitta is in this class. She works in HR for the county government and runs a fleet of mobile car washes on the side. That makes it impossible to think about college during the week, even if she would rather spend her Saturdays taking her kids to the beach. It kind of is like bittersweet because I'm doing this for my children so that I can grow in my career, better my business, and just be a role model to them. But being away from them on the only day that we both have off. Another weekend student, Sergio Espino, says after he completed his associate's degree for at Miami-Dade College, there was a long wait before he managed to come back for a BA. It was just too hard to juggle school and work while he was raising a family. It's been 40 years since I was, when I got my AS degree here, and I'm back to finish. I'm Rowan Moore Garrity in Miami. It is 7.50. This is Morning Edition on WSF 89.7. His new book is on taxes. It's called A Fine Mess, and it'll be released on April 15th. Must be a coincidence. Arthur T.R. Reed stops mm, by to lovely. talk about how other R. nations R. impose taxes and what, if anything, the U.S. can learn from them. That's coming up next on Morning Edition. Local support for Morning Edition comes from Sarasota Memorial Health Care System, the only hospital in Florida to earn a five-star rating from CMS for overall quality and safety. You can learn more at S no, no, um, no luck this time. Kind of breezy and uh, maybe some rain off and on today. 20% chance, high 86. Cloudy tonight, about the same for tomorrow and Wednesday. Then rainy on Thursday morning, clearing and turning cooler Friday, 751. President Trump wants to create American infrastructure, just like the good old days. All they wanted was people that were willing to work. And nobody asked, how much do I give an hour? They just says, I want a job, give me a job. I'm Molly Wood, the infrastructure projects that made America great. Next time on Marketplace. This evening at 6 on WSF 89.7. It's 7.51. It's Morning Edition from NPR News. Good morning, I'm David Green. And I'm Steve Inskeep. April, the cruelest month, is when taxes come due. The deadline arrives amid talk of changing the tax code. After a failed drive to change health insurance laws, President Trump said he'd like to move on. I would say that we will probably start going very, very strongly for the big tax cuts and tax reform. That'll be next. Okay, he said tax cuts, which Congress has delivered on from time to time, and also tax reform, changing tax rules, which is much harder. We hate the complexity of our tax code, but every specific complexity is a benefit that somebody really likes. An overhaul does happen every few decades, and journalist T.R. Reid says we are about due. He wrote a book called A Fine Mess, comparing the tax rules in different countries, and says the American tax code says something about who we are. It says we're people who really what? don't like government much, and oh, therefore we complain oh, whenever we have to send government a dime. Yeah. We pay less tax than all the other rich countries, but we complain more about it. And then we make up for it. Americans give away more money to private charities, 100 times as much as the French do, 50 times as much as the Brits, because we'd rather do things privately than through government. Do we really pay less than other countries? Yeah, of the 35 richest countries, our total tax burden, that is, you take all the federal, oh, state, dude, and well, local taxes I'm as a percentage of circle. GDP Why is it overall doing those wealth. Loops? Of the 35 richest countries, oh the U.S. God. ranks 32nd in total and tax burden. And I can't burden. get any more fires, The only ones dude. that pay less than we are Mexico and Chile. Amazing. We may not like taxes, but we seem to like tax breaks as a society an awful lot compared to other countries. It's amazing. There are hundreds and hundreds of giveaways in the tax code. Some of them only apply to one taxpayer, and they never list the name. They say, a company organized in Delaware on October 13, 1916. That would be General Motors, but they never mention that in the bill. 
and they cost us hundreds of billions of dollars. You know the this very popular deduction. The uh, uh, no, not really. It's the only fucking mm -hmm. ship I can play. Seventy-three <laughs> billion dollars a year. Now that's money, you know, that could treat wounded veterans, or tighten the border, or pay off Sorry. the deficit. I'm, and instead, it's a subsidy a to the richest people. Only well twenty percent of homeowners ever take it. What has happened in other countries when that's been eliminated? Great Britain got rid of the uh, mortgage interest deduction. They did it over about ten years. They phased it out. And guess what? Their home ownership rate is higher than ours. It's about 66%. Ours is now 62 and a half. But here's the thing: all the rich countries have about the same rate of home ownership. Oh God, doing that circle crap again, dude. Whether they have the deduction or not. And if you ask any economist, they'll tell you all that deduction does is raise the price of a house. You pointed out something really fascinating early in this book. You noted that uh, in the United States there are multiple ways to save money tax-free, but that Canada had a different system. What's the difference? Yeah, so we have a 401k, a 403b, a 457b, a SEP, a star SEP. There's something called the simple IRA. Guess what? To do the simple IRA, you have to fill out two different IRS forms. We've just made it incredibly complicated, and now there's a billion-dollar industry that exists just to advise Americans how to put money in the bank. Well, in Canada, they have something called the tax-free savings starboard. account. Anybody can use it. You can put the money anywhere you want and take it out, use it for anything you want, and the interest and dividends are always tax-free. It's much simpler. Let me ask about raising a tax, adding a tax. There has been talk of a carbon tax solved, to sir. discourage the creation of a pollution that's linked to climate change. Has anybody done that successfully? <laughs> Countries have tried it. It hasn't worked. Australia did the best one. Australia is a big coal producer and coal burner. They put in a carbon tax that was kind of a model for all the environmentalists. Guess what? It lasted two years. The government lost the next election, and the opposition took it away. What went wrong? Uh, as soon as they put it in, everybody's electric bill went up because the power companies had to pay the tax. And the power companies very generously put on every bill, your bill is higher because of this tax we have to pay. And, and the government lost the next election. So carbon taxes have been hard. The point of my book is all over the world, these countries are experimenting with the ideas we're talking about, and we can see whether they work or not. Can I just ask about American exceptionalism, so to speak? You know that some of these tax reforms have worked in other countries, but they all have smaller economies than the United States. They mostly have smaller populations than the United States, and we're just different. Are you sure that they can be brought to the U.S. successfully? Yes, these ideas would work regardless of the size of the country. American exceptionalism is great. We we do Yo. things that no other country Y'all see do, that, dude? That's fabulous, but Ooh. sometimes we're different just for the sake of being different. Like we're the only rich country that doesn't provide health care for everybody, Ooh. and we have the most complicated Bruh. tax code ever seen on the Bruh. planet. Y'all see that? To do oh that. my it God! Could be simpler. And we've all been reminded oh, in the Obamacare debate in recent weeks that the way that the United States Fucking government Curry. is encouraging people to buy health insurance now is Step Curry, the man. Tax <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how we Jeez do things Louise. in our country. Why does Bologna. it take so many decades to enact tax reform in the United States? Yeah, what we've seen in our history is there was a tax code in 1922, big reform in 1954, big reform in 1986. That's every 32 years. And the reason is, over three decades, you get this huge accumulation oh, wow, of loopholes missed. and credits and exemptions and new rules. Up. And it just becomes such a monster, nobody can deal with this. About every 32 years, and guess what? 32 years from 1986 is 2018, so the time has come for us to fix our tax code. Wait a minute, so President Trump might have picked the right moment to seize upon this as his next big priority? Well, if you believe in history repeating yes. itself, absolutely, this is the time. So let me come back yeah, to the notion the that the tax code says something about who we are, what our values are. Uh, if the tax code suggests who we are as a people, what are some features of the tax code of the United States that are unlikely to ever change? We probably will never have oh, no. higher rates than Oh Europe no, I might die. Because we just fuck. Don't government as much as the Swedes Hurry the fuck do up. The Kill him. Do. It doesn't ah. have to be as complicated. And no. Oh no, it's down to the war. Oh, I am so fucked.
complicated because there's a huge uh, industry now of tax preparation that has a big interest in oh, complicated man. taxes. Is that basically uh, American? I argue in my book we could get rid of it. I mean, the IRS could fill out the see form if he can dance. for about 80% of all tax preparation. Can he dance? Oh, he can outrun it. Oh, I can't believe this TR shit. The latest book is called A Fine Mess, oh, a global quest for a simpler, fairer, and more efficient tax system. Thanks oh, no. Much. Thank you, Steve. Oh, he Great did it. To you. And he joined he us via Skype it. on Morning Edition God from NPR News. It is 7.59. This is WUSA. Oh, so close. And if a self-driving so car is in a close. crash, the other guy. driver's not at fault. So I probably should just auto-drop on that guy. And what do insurance Damn. companies, on what do they base their rates? When you have dramatically different technologies, it makes predicting the future much harder because you don't have those reliable data about the past and present. NPR's Yuki Noguchi takes a look at that, and uh, we will take a look at the future of autonomous vehicles and the Florida-based research on them on Florida Matters coming up tomorrow evening at 6.30. Definitely not your ordinary night at the theater as Oslo represents the elaborate entrance of Chad Deity. This comedy is set in the world of professional wrestling to tell a story about race, culture, and TV ratings. Tickets are at OsloRep.org. This is WUSF 89.7 Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota. Broadcasting from the University of South Florida. A news update from NPR is next. It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. A Senate committee votes today on Neil Gorsuch for a seat on the U.S. Supreme Court. The looming question is whether he can overcome a filibuster in the full Senate. We'll talk it through coming up in this hour of Morning Edition from NPR News. So we're, we're the most complaining of all tax-paying countries. China's leader visits the U.S. this week. That's and good. China has prepared by contacting President Trump's son-in-law. I'm David Green. And I'm Stephen Scape. <laughs> In this hour, two ethics lawyers argue Jared Kushner has yet to clear up his many business conflicts. Said, the U.S. Uh, faces complex relations with two world son-in-law. powers, China and Russia. We'll ask how the new administration is balancing two very different rivals. Also this hour, the advent of the self-driving car will force some changes in car insurance. It's Monday, April 3rd. Que sera, sera. Doris Day is 95 years old. The news is next. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Corva Coleman. The Senate Judiciary Committee is meeting today to consider the Supreme Court nomination of Neil Gorsuch. NPR's Merritt Kennedy reports the committee is expected to approve him. The nomination is likely to head to the full Senate this week, and what happens there is probably going to be contentious. Supreme Court nominees typically need to obtain at least 60 votes to be confirmed. If Gorsuch doesn't cross that threshold, Senate Democrats may filibuster. If they do so, Republicans are threatening to change the procedures so that they can confirm Gorsuch with fewer votes, which has been dubbed the nuclear option. On NBC's Meet the Press, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said that Gorsuch will be approved this week, one way or another. Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said later in the show that Supreme Court justice confirmations should require 60 votes. That's how you get a mainstream justice. He proposed changing the nominee. Merrick Kennedy, NPR News, Washington. Egypt's president begins his first official visit to the U.S. today, and it's controversial. NPR's Jane Arath explains why. President Abdel Fattah Hassisi took power in a military coup. He was never invited to the White House during the Obama administration. But a senior White House official says the Trump administration wants to reboot its relationship with Egypt. Both sides expect more support for Egypt's own fight against ISIS and less public criticism of its human rights record. NPR's Jane Arath reporting. White House advisor Jared Kushner is in Iraq today. White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer says he is on the ground. Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law, was invited by Joint Chiefs Chairman General Joseph Dunford. An Iranian-American sentenced to 18 years in an Iranian prison has been released on bail, according to a human rights group. NPR's Peter Kenyon reports it's not clear whether he will be allowed to leave the country. Robin Reza Shahini was arrested last July during a visit with family in northeastern Iran. Prosecutors leveled charges of spreading propaganda via the Voice of America. The human rights activist news agency says Shahini wrote a letter saying that a previous visit to Iran had coincided with the street protests following the 2009 presidential election, and he had taken part in a peaceful protest but had done nothing wrong. 
Tehran said Shahini was convicted on national security charges. The rights group believes the bail paid was about $60,000. Another Iranian-American, businessman Shamak Namazi, was arrested in 2015, and his 80-year-old father was detained last year. Both were convicted of spying for the U.S., which oh, their supporters wow. called Oh, missed it. Oh, my God. Peter Kenyon and Peter and he's A.S. Louisiana officials Ooh. say a mother he's and her toddler daughter were killed on Sunday <laughs> after a tornado flipped Fucking their mobile home. Oh, it's the a dual carry game. Wasn't even paying attention. The Louisiana Governor John oh, Bell man. Edwards has placed the whole state That's fine. on high I'll alert. Be patient. Meanwhile, the National Good Weather strikes, Service is strikes, warning of the go. chance of more dangerous storms today from Louisiana up to South Carolina. This is NPR. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include visiting angels, professional caregivers assisting adults might, in bathing, dressing, I don't know why he's meals, for the Koenig, and light though. housework nationwide. Should have went for the carrier. Visiting since angels, since America's the choice didn't detect in senior him, home care. You know? Office locations are at visitingangels.com. Uh, he has something going on. Good morning, it's 8.04. I'm Carson Cooper, WUSF 89.7 oh News. The only thing state lawmakers oh must my God, do by you. law each year is wow. pass a balanced budget. And Shit. as of this morning, that's looking to be a bit of a challenge. Budget negotiations are ready up. to begin with a $2 billion gap We're between fucked. the House and Senate. If the I House gets its way, you. the final budget will be worth $81.2 billion. The Senate is figuring on $83.2 billion. Naples Republican Carlos Trujillo is in charge of House appropriations. For the first time in at least my time up here, we've gone after recurring Ready projects and number of projects oh, that have damn. eliminated a substantial amount of them. The House plan would cut college and university budgets in spite of Senate President Joe Negron's focus on boosting higher education in the state. The Senate may also balk at cuts in health care. As for school spending, the Senate wants a 3% increase, the House 1.23%, and the House and Senate don't appear to be eye-to-eye -eye on school property tax rates. The Senate budget does include a pay raise for state workers. The House is calling for targeted raises only for certain workers. The session is scheduled to end on May 5th. Florida House Education Committee is showing some love for charter schools and just passed a measure that would encourage certain charter target. operators to move into wow. areas with repeatedly low performing wow. traditional schools. Two hundred million dollars have been sent. Oh my god, he's not even dodging it. Schools of hope. He's like all right. charter operators Hit it. With a good track record could oh open up quickly god. in potato, areas man. where traditional public schools keep getting potato. D's or F's on state report cards. Land of Lakes House wow. Speaker Richard Corcoran. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars more than ever before to say that it is reprehensible oh, that you would take a child Heller. and make them stay in a failure factory, not yeah, for one year, not for two years, that. not for three years, not for four years, but five years. That, 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 that whole system has to end. Many Democrats don't like the idea of spending that money on charters instead of spending more on the troubled schools. The Neurological diseases are costing Americans a lot of money. For the most part, Americans are living longer and surviving chronic conditions like heart disease and cancer. USF researchers say this has led to a rising number of neurological disorders among the elderly. But what's even more alarming is the costs. Dr. Clifton Gucha is the study's lead author. By contrast, the entire U.S. military budget in 2016 was $598 billion. So this total actually exceeds military spending in the U.S., and, and the U.S. has the largest military budget in the world. He says disorders like stroke, dementia, migraines, and epilepsy cost nearly $800 billion a year. Gucci says this is that more federal funding is needed to speed up the development of treatments and cures. Breezy with a 20% chance for showers today, high 86. Julie Marquez of 89 says cloudy tonight, about the same for tomorrow and Wednesday. It's 8.07. It's morning edition from NPR News. I'm Steve Inskeep. And I'm David Green. Good morning. President Donald Trump is facing some math problems. He needs to add up enough votes in the House to pass bills on health care and the budget, but he's been fighting with many of the members he needs to support him. Now, in the Senate... The president does have a majority to approve his Supreme Court nominee this week, but a majority is not enough. And the question is whether Majority Leader Mitch McConnell Attention. will change the, the calculus position. of the Senate to prevent Democrats from blocking All Judge Neil Gorsuch. Here's McConnell's speaking on Fox News Sunday. Judge Gorsuch is going to be confirmed. The way in which that occurs is in the hands of the Democratic minority. And I think during the course of the week, 
we'll find out exactly how this uh, will end. But it will end uh, with his confirmation. And let's talk about all this with NPR political editor Domenico Montanaro, who's on the line. Domenico, good morning. Good morning, David. So let's start with the nomination of Neil Gorsuch to the court. Uh, some are saying there could be a nuclear showdown this <laughs> week. McConnell saying it's in the hands of the Democrats. How does this all work? Yeah, and they keep calling this nuclear because they're going to probably move toward eliminating the requirement to uh, need 60 votes to advance a nominee for the Supreme Court if Democrats, if not enough Democrats, get on board to uh, support Gorsuch. And right now, it does not look like that's going to happen. Just three Democrats have come forward, and McConnell has been dangling this nuclear quote-unquote threat. And it really could be the week if in 50 years from now we look back and see that the court has fundamentally changed, that this is the week where it did. Not only did the Senate fundamentally change and become more like the House, where you'd only need a majority rules instead of needing 60 votes, but then the kinds of nominees that you could have is the real risk, uh, potentially, to the court at some point. Because you, you have this rule there's a filibuster. And the Democrats um, could begin a filibuster. Republicans would need 60 votes to end it. And, and that's always sort of been the way of the Senate to prevent, you know, really radical nominees or, or what some would view as radical nominees from being able to come through. Right. That's the whole thing. I mean, this could mean more partisan picks. This started down that path in 2013 when uh, Democratic now uh, former majority leader Harry Reid from Nevada changed this because Barack Obama couldn't get his judiciary nominees through because the Republicans had used the filibuster so often that he couldn't get those picks through. If you think about this, a pick like Betsy DeVos, where so many Democrats were enraged by her uh, getting on, uh, becoming education secretary, she yeah. probably never would have gotten through uh, if this rule were not eliminated. Well, it seems like everyone agrees this is not a good thing if this happens this week, but no one is willing to back down. We heard Mitch McConnell. This is uh, his Democratic counterpart, uh, Chuck Schumer, on NBC's Meet the Press. Our Republican friends are acting like, you know, they're a cat on the top of a tree, and they have to jump off with all the damage that entails. Come back off the tree, sit down, and work with us, and we will produce a mainstream nominee. Senator Schumer. Sure Republicans love being called a cat on a tree. Um, so... Schumer is saying that just come down from the tree, let's talk about a mainstream nominee. But quietly in the legal community, even people who are concerned about more conservative judges say that Gorsuch is, is qualified. But why are Democrats so dug in here? You know, he obviously has sterling legal credentials, but he's also very conservative. But you also have this, quote, resist movement on the Democratic side. You have a progressive base that is amped up against any kind of... Uh, Donald Trump policy, and they want to be able to try to do whatever they can to try to stop uh, Gorsuch's nomination. But this has less to do with Neil Gorsuch himself and more to do with Merrick Garland. You might remember Barack Obama's uh, nominee for the sure. Supreme Court, who never even got a hearing, David. So the so Democrats still angry about that? Absolutely. Um, President Trump tweeting yesterday talking about love and strength in the Republican Party and it being underestimated. Um, you know, he went through this debacle with health care. There were Republicans who stood up to him. Cruiser. One of them cheering on the House members who stood up to, to Donald Trump was Senator Rand Paul, who went golfing with the president yesterday and the White House playing up that they actually talked about health care. Can you have substantive conversations over a golf game? Well, I mean, that's something that they actually teach in business schools, so... <laughs> Uh, you sure can. I don't know what kind of golf game either Trump or uh, Rand Paul have, so maybe they do have a lot to talk about. But really, at this point, you know, this is about Trump trying to break the Freedom Caucus, trying to peel off the kinds of people who might be influential with them, trying this little bit of a charm game with Rand Paul, and maybe he could have some influence with them. But right now, Republicans are still in this box. If the Freedom Caucus doesn't go along with uh, Paul Ryan's agenda, then they need Democrats. And if Paul Ryan is saying we're not going to work with Democrats, then you can't get anything done. Is the president's agenda in trouble? I mean, the president's legislative agenda is in a whole heap of trouble. Right now, he's stalled and sputtering in this presidency. There's nothing that's getting done. He's resorting to executive orders and executive action, something that usually a president only does when they can't get stuff through legislatively. That is not enough. You know, President Obama only resorted to doing immigration uh, executive orders when it was clear immigration reform, for example, wasn't going to pass the House. So what should we look for in terms of signs that President Trump might be getting his agenda back on track? Well, I mean, obviously, if you start to see... Uh, 
some of these Freedom Caucus members start to peel off and they say they're going to work with them on tax reform and specific examples. But tax reform is going to be even more difficult. And this week we know that Trump is going to be focusing on foreign policy. He's going to be talking with various foreign leaders who are coming to the U.S., including President Xi of China, at the end of the week. Uh, so, you know, there are two things that presidents can often impact more directly than legislation. That's foreign policy fire. and judges. We know this week he'll probably get a Supreme Court nominee through. We'll see if because the domestic legislative agenda has been stalled, if he moves more toward uh, foreign affairs. Okay. NPR political editor Domenico Montanaro. Thanks as always. Thank you. Problem solved, sir. Last month, a car using self-driving features crashed with a human driver. That accident in Tempe, Arizona, did not result in any major injuries, but it did highlight new issues for the auto insurance industry. NPR's Yuki Noguchi asked how the industry might change its business model. Warren Buffett's company owns insurance giant Geico, and in a February interview on CNBC, he said this. The day comes when a significant portion of the cars on the road are autonomous. It will hurt Geico's business very significantly. It seems to make sense. If humans are driving the cars, who needs a car insurance policy? Well, it's certainly a, a topic of heavy conversation right now. At least it is a big topic for Rick Gorbett of the Casualty Actuarial Society, a trade group for people who analyze risk. He says right now, insurance rates are calculated mostly based on the attributes of drivers, their claims, histories, and driving records. A driverless car changes that model. Gorbett says the conventional wisdom, not yet backed up by a lot of actual data, is that autonomous cars will help reduce much of the human error that is the cause of the vast majority of accidents. In other words, fewer accidents. But accidents will still happen, and when they do, they will more likely be the fault of machine, not man. At least current thinking is that the manufacturers will be ultimately responsible for a lot of these future accidents when an automated vehicle is involved. How much that burden shifts is also a key question. James Lynch, the chief actuary for the Insurance Information Institute, is watching the transition to autonomous vehicles. He says if manufacturers have to bear all the insurance costs, that would create a huge long-term expense for car makers. And that, in turn, could create disincentives for development. If you believe that the autonomous technology is going to be saving lives, then you would want them to have some sort of a protection. That's not what's happening in Michigan, where a recent law specified automakers will assume the liability when driverless systems are at fault. In any event, the era of full automation is many years away. And in the interim, drivers and autonomous cars will share the road. So Bryant Walker Smith, a law professor at the University of South Carolina, says for the Problem most solved, part, sir. fault and liability will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, much in the same way it is now. Who was speeding? Was there a stop sign? What was the weather? Did the vehicle fail? Uh, and in the future, the same questions will be asked. The difference is just that the tech-savvy cars of the future will gather far more data to help determine fault in each instance. Details of that will be worked out by courts in individual cases, and those individual cases will provide the backdrop against which insurers start determining their exposure and then eventually the rates that they charge. The problem, Smith says, is that insurance companies rely on historic information to formulate algorithms to help them predict future risk. But such data about driverless cars and accidents simply does not exist yet. When you have dramatically different technologies and new applications for automated driving, it makes predicting the future much harder because you don't have those reliable data about the past and fire. present. Today, an increasing number of conventional cars offer safety features Problem like solved, automatic sir. braking and blind spot monitoring, Autopilot capabilities that are partial steps toward automation. Insurance experts say if automakers collect and analyze more of that data, that should give them more valuable clues about how to think about risk in the future. Yuki Noguchi, NPR News, Washington. This is NPR News. Good morning. It's 818. This is WSF 89.7. I'm Carson Cooper. Norman Eisen and Richard Painter 
Our former White House ethics lawyers who have become sort of the go-to experts on Donald Trump's complex business dealings. Lots of money there, and they will stop by for a look at Trump's wealth and whether or not he's playing by the rules. That's coming up in about three minutes on Morning Edition. On Barry Roads this morning, Hillsborough County, a crash on U.S. 41 northbound in Gibsonton, a lane block near Palm Avenue. Also, Fowler Avenue westbound at 56th Street, and traffic is very slow there. U.S. 301 southbound approaching Fowler Avenue, a lane block near Jackson Road. And across the bay, Pinellas County, U.S. 19 northbound just north of 102nd Avenue north. And traffic comes to us from Total Traffic and Pet Supermarkets. This is WUSF 89.7. It's 819. From NPR News in Washington, I'm Dave Mattingly. Senior White House advisor Jared Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law, is in Iraq today. Kushner is traveling with Joint Chiefs Chairman General Joseph Dunford. They're holding talks with Iraqi officials on the fight against ISIS. President Trump is meeting at the White House today with Egypt's president. That's where efforts to defeat ISIS are also on the agenda. President Trump is preparing to host his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, in Florida this week. As NPR's Anthony Kuhn reports, their first summit is set for Mr. Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach. Chinese state media quote Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and China's state councillor Yang Jiechi as saying that the summit at Mar-a-Lago will be crucial to the development of U.S.-China ties. Trump said in a Sunday interview with the Financial Times that if China doesn't help talk North Korea out of its nuclear ambitions, the U.S. may act unilaterally. Strong storms and possible tornadoes are in the forecast today from the Gulf Coast of the U.S. to the Carolinas. We'll probably see it continue through the day into out across southern Alabama, into parts of Georgia, Florida, and maybe even up into South Carolina. That's meteorologist Rich Thompson at NOAA's Storm Prediction Center. Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards put the entire state on high alert because of severe weather. Alabama's Gulf Coast is said to be at greatest risk for the strong storms. I'm Dave Mattingly, NPR News in Washington. And taking a look at the prison population lately. you got two New Yorkers. They've been in there for over 1,300 days. A 17-year-old New Jersey miner just got arrested last November. And the added problem is that they're being held in Egyptian prisons. Will Donald Trump say anything about this when Egypt's president meets with him today? NPR's Michelle Kellerman has a story coming up in about 15 minutes. Support for WUSF comes from our members and the Baby Boomers Barrister, a law firm that caters exclusively to baby boomers and their parents, helping boomers control their property now and after they die and helping their parents with long-term care planning and financing. Babyboomersbarrister.com. Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, ranked by U.S. News and World Report as the top 50 children's hospital and standing at the forefront of innovative clinical education and research for childhood disease prevention and cure. Learn more at hopkinsallchildrens.org. Well, the 2017 class of the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame has been announced. There are more than 260 patents among the eight inductees. We will meet USF electrical engineering professor Richard Griffin to talk about two of his creations on University Beat tomorrow morning at 6.45 and 8.45. This is WUSF 89.7. It's 8.22. Support for NPR comes from NPR member stations and from Constant Contact. With live coaching, email marketing features such as drag-and-drop editing, and social media tools, Constant Contact is committed to helping small businesses and nonprofits become marketers. More at ConstantContact.com. From Atlassian, maker of collaboration software, Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, and Trello. Working to help teams across industries ascend to new heights to create what's next. Learn more at Atlassian.com. Atlassian, team up. And from Angie's List, committed to helping its members select local service providers and professionals they can count on. Offering over 20 years of ratings and reviews. Learn more at Angie'sList.com. Angie's List, home is where our heart is.
This is Morning Edition from NPR News. Good morning. I'm David Green. And I'm Steve Inskeep. Let's explore the wealth of the top officials in the Trump administration. Late Friday, the White House disclosed information about the personal finances of some of its employees. One estimate says the president and his staff may be worth a combined $12 billion, which the White House considers a selling point. They're successful. And our next guests consider perilous because of the business conflicts that come with their new jobs. Two ethics lawyers have challenged the administration are questioning the business of Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and top advisor. They are Richard Painter and Norman Eisen, top Donald ethics Starks. lawyers for Presidents Bush and Obama. They're back once again. Gentlemen, good morning. Autopilot good morning. Good morning. Uh, what's wrong with Jared Kushner? I thought he was the guy who actually took uh, some pretty solid steps to separate himself from this business. Well, there's uh, a number of unusual features that were revealed in the White House's uh, Friday night uh, document dump of mm -hmm. financial disclosures, above all relating to Jared and his wife Ivanka. Uh, both uh, Professor Painter and myself, when we were serving in White Houses of uh, different political parties, uh, required people to give up very broadly their financial holdings, their companies, their business. But that's what I'm asking about. Hasn't Jared Kushner resigned from his positions for the most part, more than a couple hundred different positions that he's, he held? He's resigned quite a bit, but he's also hanging on to business interests, as is Ivanka, and that creates a plethora of conflicts. Take, for example, uh, his loans. Uh, he has uh, indebtedness uh, to some 10 financial institutions. That means, Steve, that he is not going to be able uh, to work at a minimum on uh, real estate issues relating to financial regulation, maybe more broadly on financial regulation. So when you have issues like Dodd-Frank, uh, he's going to have to recuse himself. Richard Painter, you pointed out that he didn't disclose who these loans are to, but reportedly they've included Goldman Sachs, the Blackstone Group, Deutsche Bank, a French bank, an Israeli bank. But frankly, everybody's got a mortgage or something. Is this really a problem? Well, he has a very extensive uh, real estate empire, and uh, real estate always has a lot of debt on it. That's the way the business works. You use a lot of debt, and uh, he is going to have to recuse from uh, any aspect of bank regulation that affects the real estate industry. And that's an awful lot of it because we know the 2008 crisis was triggered by problems uh, in the mortgage industry. And um, we are uh, anticipating <coughs> some serious uh, problems in the commercial real estate industry as well. And so he's going to be out of Dodd-Frank of uh, banking repeal because it's all one big bill. It's not going to, he's not going to be able to parse through this, uh, the conflicts out of banking reform, also tax reform, because there's tax ex aspects the of uh, here? Here? real estate, and there, there's special good. tax goodies uh, in the tax code for real estate developers, and those will be on the table, so it'll be out of tax uh, reform. And then finally, they're going to have to be out of trade, because Ivanka has a business uh, yeah, we, making we clothing abroad, I believe in China, a number of places. And then bringing up the United States over here and putting a big markup on it. Uh, so she's out of trade. So those are three big areas uh, that both of them are going to stay out of uh, banking reform, tax, and trade. I'm glad uh, they that you can mentioned, do it. I'm glad that you mentioned China because the president of China is in the oh, United States shit. this week. Jared Kushner, according to multiple reports, has been deeply involved in setting up the visit. Aboard. But you point out Fuck that there me. are business interests for Kushner and Ivanka Trump in to, China. The I Financial Times, in fact, reported over the weekend. Uh, involving the president as well. Since uh, the president's inauguration, China has approved dozens of pending trademark applications by the Trump Organization, and, quote, the volume of applications to market Ivanka Trump's brand in China has also soared. What's happening there, Norm Eisen? Well, it's a, um, uh, another indicator of the ways in which uh, the Trump uh, family views the White House as a giant marketing opportunity. But in terms of uh, the White House service of Ivanka and Jared and spousal conflicts are attributed from one partner to the other, uh, so Jared is saddled with this too. It's uh, concerning that uh, China has these uh, trademarks that uh, operate as a lever a liar, uh, on, they have something that Ivanka wants very badly, like the power Jew of too. trademark approval. Couldn't so it, it, it casts stuff. a cloud over the negotiations with China. It raises the question 
Uh, will the Trump family really be as uh, tough as they purport to be in these negotiations, or will they be subject to influence by China? That's concerning to us. Would each of you take your best shot at the thing that we do hear from the president's supporters, who essentially will say, uh, well, they're successful, that's not a bad thing, and we understand that you're raising all these ethics concerns, but they're already rich. Why would they go and steal money and take advantage of the country when they're already rich? This is something that they're is They're not said. stealing well, money. the problem the is they uh, have to follow the law, and it's a criminal statute that says you may not participate in a government stealing. matter that will have an effect what on your financial about, interests. Dude? Regardless of what your motives are, it's a criminal offense. Uh, so th there's planet. a big problem here. Uh, for example, with Any China, uh, when uh, China acts up or does something we don't want or now maybe doesn't help us enough with North Korea, uh, President Trump may very well threaten uh, to cut off trade. Uh, that is the one way uh, that we think we can tell China what to do, say we're not going to have good trade relationships. Well, immediately then Jared and Ivanka are out of the discussion because she's importing clothing from China. <coughs> President Trump, uh, uh, this law doesn't apply to him, so he can run around uh, uh, furthering his own business interests uh, in these negotiations, uh, but uh, they would uh, commit a criminal offense. So they have to step out of the room and leave them alone. Twenty seconds, uh, Richard. Uh, although the, of course, the statute doesn't apply, Constitution does apply to President Trump. Forbids foreign government cash. His son has said they're getting a lot of Russian money in their businesses. He said years ago, yeah. Uh, and uh, so we still need to see Trump's own tax returns. To answer your question, rich people, in my experience, sometimes want more. Norman Eisen and Richard Painter, thanks to both of you. This is NPR News. It is 8.30. This is WUSF 89.7. Will Gonzaga takes on North Carolina for the Men's College Basketball Championship tonight in Glendale, Arizona. Bulldogs and Tar Heels and NPR's Tom Goldman has a preview coming up in 15 minutes. The Foundation for a Healthy St. Petersburg harnesses the power of change, bringing the community together to support programs that optimize the health of all residents you can learn more at HealthyStPete.Foundation. Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association and Visit Florida. All year long, great Florida events feature fresh and local flavors, heart-pumping music, and experiences. To enjoy and learn more about Florida's hospitality, details are at frla.org. It's 831. I'm Carson Cooper, WUSF 89.7 News. Last November, Chicago Archbishop Blaise Kupik tweeted a photograph of himself and Pope Francis holding a Cubs hat and an autographed baseball. That led more than a few folks to figure the Pope was a Cubs fan. The notion of baseball as a metaphor for religion has not been lost on the USF Religious Studies Club. A day after the Rays' opening day win over the Yankees, the club is marking the new season with a discussion of religion and baseball. Del Deschamps is the chair of the USF Department of Religious Studies. When the team is successful, and in the case of the Cubs it was nearly a century if not more, there's a sense of redemption, a sense of salvation, a sense of reward for this lifelong commitment, this lifelong faith. Baseball, America's sacred pastime, begins with a screening of the movie Field of Dreams this afternoon at 4 in the USF Marshall Student Center in Tampa. And you won't have to miss the game. Game 2 of that series of the Yankees is tomorrow at Tropicana Field. Breezy today with a 20% chance for showers, a high of 86. Julie Marquez of 89 says cloudy tonight down to 71. Not much of a change for tomorrow or Wednesday, then rainy on Thursday, mainly in the morning, then clearing throughout the day, turning breezy and cooler on Friday and through the weekend. This is WUSF 89.7 News, information and all night jazz. It's 832. If we have the technology, why don't self-driving cars take over now? Turns out humans are still getting the hang of them. 
it may be the most complex activity that most adults on the planet engage in. I'm Ari Shapiro. Uber is testing autonomous vehicles in Pittsburgh. We take a ride in one and see how the experiment is going. This afternoon on All Things Considered from NPR News. From 4 to 6 on WSF 89.7, it's 8.33. Support for NPR comes from NPR member stations. And from C3 IoT, bringing cloud computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and IoT big data solutions to commercial, industrial, and government business processes. Learn more at C3IoT.com. From Eli Lilly and Company, striving to unite caring with discovery to make life better. Working to discover life-changing medicines in the areas of diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease at lillyforbetter.com. And from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm David Green. And I'm Steve Inskeep. President Trump heads into a week hosting important foreign leaders under a cloud of investigations into whether his campaign colluded in some way with Russia to influence the presidential election. Let's talk about how those events might be related with Mary Beth Long. She served President George W. Bush in the Defense Department. She's now with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Welcome to the program once again. Good morning, Steve. Glad you could come by. How does it affect a president when he goes on abroad while under investigation at home? I think that a lot of our interlocutors abroad view this investigation as largely uh, domestic political matter, mm -hmm. but it does make um, some of our allies seem hesitant as to whether or not these kinds of investigations are a distraction to what the foreign policy planning and, and policy direction destroyed. of an administration may be. So oh, they're, wondering, they're wondering if the administration will have its eye on the ball. Absolutely. I don't think that many of them honestly believe that there'll be some kind of smoking gun evidence of collusion. If you, if you ask them, um, is it come as a surprise that Russia tried to meddle in our domestic elections? Absolutely not. Uh, most of them have been complaining about that for years, particularly in Europe. Is it a surprise to them that an incoming administration would have uh, conversations and, and uh, preliminary discussions with the Russians? Absolutely not. I think they'd be more surprised that an incoming administration would have no contact with such a major interlocutor. Hmm. Uh, would it come as a surprise that there was some kind of knowing complicit uh, actions on the part of either of the parties? Absolutely. I think they'd be as shocked as we are, but there's really been no real evidence of that. Well, let me ask a related question here, because the president is going to meet with the president of China uh, at Mar-a-Lago in Florida this week. Um, the president has been accused, uh, if that's the word, of trying to be nice or reset the relationship with Russia. One of the reasons advanced for that would be to use Russia in some way against China. Those are your two great rivals on the world stage, and you try to use one against the other if you can. Does that make sense to do that? It makes sense to use them as leverage against one another. I think one of the reasons why uh, you will see the president of China here first is the very pressing need to get some kind of action to either forestall or persuade uh, North Korea from its nuclear and missile activities, number one. Number two, I think the administration wisely chose to delay a state visit or a high-level visit with Russia, particularly here on U.S. soil, in order as to uh, mitigate concerns that the administration was leaning way too forward in its skis when it comes to dealing with Russia. Okay, uh, but is the administration leaning way too forward in its skis when it comes to dealing with China? And I ask that because while the president has talked tough about China on trade, the Secretary of State went to China, repeated Chinese talking points about China's role in the world. Uh, does the, do, do you understand where the administration is heading with China? I don't think we've had a lot of articulation on what our China policy is. I think we've had uh, a number of statements. Nikki Haley, I think, has said several things in the United Nations. Oh, the we've UN had, ambassador, right? Yes, of course. And um, over the weekend, we had uh, Tillerson, our Secretary of State, talk about the need. Uh, in fact, the president has talked about the need for China to engage effectively with the North Koreans. I think um, as far as our foreign policy is concerned, we may not see a huge differentiation between the former administration and this President Trump, uh, where we will see it mostly with China, will likely be in trade and economic and perhaps uh, climate issues. Not a big, in a few seconds, not a big change on North Korea? A uh, huge change on North Korea, and that's where this trip with uh, the visit is very important. Okay. Mary Beth Long, thanks for coming by once again. Thank you. She's now with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies.
All right, so that China visit is later this week. Today, Egypt's president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, will be visiting the White House. And the people watching closely will include a young American who spent a year and a half in an Egyptian jail. Here's NPR's Michelle Kellerman. Two years ago, Ohio State graduate and American citizen Mohammed Sultan emerged from an Egyptian prison in terrible shape. We were uh, blindfolded, we tortured from time to time. Um, I still have the uh, cigarette burn scars on the back of my neck, and I still wake up uh, until today. Uh, wake up in the middle of the night frantically from just sounds of shaking keys or slamming doors or loud noises. Egyptian police shot him in the arm and arrested him in 2013 while he was live tweeting protests against the coup that ousted President Mohamed Morsi. Sultan's father served in that government and is still in jail. So too are tens of thousands of Egyptians from across the political spectrum. He says at least seven of them are Americans, though NPR has learned the number is closer to 20. Some of them were arrested before me. You got two New Yorkers that are still in there. They've been in there since August of 2013. The most recent one is a 17-year-old New Jersey miner who just got arrested last November. If Trump really wants an America first agenda, he says, the U.S. should demand that the Egyptian president release those Americans as the U.S. did for him. If the previous administration, President Obama, struggled to get one American citizen out right here sitting in front of you, let's see if President Trump can do better. White House officials say they will handle these human rights issues in a, quote, private, discreet way. They describe Egypt as a pillar of stability and a reliable partner for decades. But Michelle Dunn of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace calls Egypt a problematic ally, and she says aid to Egypt has been on autopilot too long, totaling $77 billion since 1948, according to the Congressional Research Service. $77 billion is a lot of money. It was meant to bolster peace in the region, and indeed the Egyptian-Israeli peace has held. It was also meant to develop Egypt and to help and Egypt move in a positive alert. direction. And I don't think that has happened. The Egyptian government is said to be seeking more aid from President Trump at a time when the White House is calling for dramatic cuts in spending overseas. Mohammed Sultan, the former political prisoner, wants the U.S. to use its money as leverage to get Americans out of jail. He's been lobbying hard on this and says he's feeling much better two years after he was free. The physical pain goes away, it takes maybe days, months, years, but it's a psychological torture that I endured and thousands of others continue to endure, including Americans today. That stuff stays with you. He says he feels a great responsibility to continue to shine a light on this with the Egyptian leader Sisi in town. Michelle Kellerman, NPR News, Washington. This is NPR News. It is 841, and this is WUSF 89.7. Well, the uh, men's college basketball championship is tonight. Glendale, Arizona, NPR's Tom Goldman previews Gonzaga and North Carolina coming up next. Heading in this morning, a big problem on uh, I-75 in Manatee County. There was a crash earlier still causing uh, traffic issues on I-75 southbound from uh, about 275 on down to University Parkway. So that's a pretty good stretch of traffic to stop and go back up to uh, 275. Pasco County, U.S. 19 southbound, but uh, just south of State Road 52. Hillsborough County, Dale Mabry at Van Dyke and Fowler Avenue westbound at 56th Street. Traffic comes to us from Total Traffic and the Ad Council. This is WUSF 89.7 News, information, and all-night jazz. It's 842. From NPR News in Washington, I'm Dave Mattingly. There are reports of deaths aboard a subway train in the Russian city of St. Petersburg today. Explosions occurred on two subway cars. Emergency officials say at least 10 people were killed. Judge Neil Gorsuch is expected to be confirmed today by the Senate Judiciary Committee to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. A vote by the full Senate on President Trump's nominee is expected later this week. 
South Dakota Senator John Thune, a Republican, says he's not overly worried about efforts by Senate Democrats to block Gorsuch. The Democrats at the moment at least sound like they intend to try and block him through the use of the filibuster. I hope that it won't come to that, but I certainly think in the end that given an opportunity to get an up and down vote that he will be confirmed. Thune was speaking to NPR's Morning Edition. Britain and Spain appear to be at odds over the fate of Gibraltar. The small peninsula is British territory attached to Spain. Lauren Freyer reports tensions are rising as the UK begins the formal process of exiting the European Union. Gibraltar fears that once it's out of the EU, its neighbor Spain may try to take over. The UK foreign minister says nothing will happen without the consent of the people of Gibraltar and the UK. A former Conservative Party leader says Britain is willing to go to war to keep the peninsula. And now Spain's foreign minister is accusing Britain of losing its composure. I'm Dave Mattingly, NPR News in Washington. There's a company in Lakeland that accepts and recycles waste, and it's really causing quite a stink. The Lakeland Ledger reports that a judge may soon be asked to shut the plant down. Some city commissioners say the BS Ranch and Farm has become a nuisance. It recycles out-of-date food and, yes, human waste into soil that's sold to growers. Plants' neighbors in the East Lakeland say the stench has been getting worse. Last draw appears to be that the company is kept accepting waste from Orange County after a cease and desist order was issued. More business news coming up on the Marketplace Morning Report in about eight minutes. <coughs> the Palladium is your home for jazz, blues, chamber music, and more. This April, the Palladium features the Palladium Chamber Players on April 12th and multi-instrumentalist David Amram on April 14th. Tickets and information are at mypalladium.org. Baycare, when Lakota Lockhart fell asleep, his breathing would stop, but he was treated oh, at a rare place, Baycare St. Joseph's Children's Hospital. Today, Lakota is, is a... living a full life and fighting for children's health care rights. Pretty Watch sure his story is, uh... at humanityandwork.org. Yeah, okay. um, well, thank you for see. supporting our Cancel spring campaign, Cancel which Cancel ended that. on Friday afternoon. It means a lot when listeners like you help support the programs you depend on. If you miss a chance to take part, you can still right. donate at WUSF.org. Support <laughs> NPR comes from NPR member Complete stations. the task and random battle and with from the Annenberg Foundation. Shit. Committed to supporting, I'll educating, and engaging communities in the United States and High globally caliber, for more no. than 25 years. Uh, Learn more at Annenberg.org. From the Langmoth these, Foundation, these are all tier 10. supporting innovative um, health and mental health programs yeah. for <laughs> underserved populations. At Langmoth.org. And well, from American say Jewish World battle, Service, so working one. for 30 years to end poverty one. and advance human rights in a single worldwide. Battle, yeah, that's Learn too more hard. at AJWS.org. Uh, is this hard? It's Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm Steve Inskeep. And I'm David Green. College basketball wraps up its season tonight with one final All game. Right, North Carolina and Gonzaga will play for the men's Division I championship. The game will be taking place outside Phoenix, Arizona. And NPR sports correspondent Tom Goldman is there ready to cover it. Tom, good morning. Good morning. Waiting for that one shining moment, Wait, David Green. Waiting for that one shining moment. We'll hear that song uh, when this all wraps up, um, <laughs> as they always play. You know, I want to get to the men's game, but we should talk about uh, the women's championship first. The University of South Carolina celebrating this morning. Was this a surprise? You know, it was for those who started paying attention to women's basketball last Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when Mississippi State scored that epic upset of four-time defending champion UConn. You remember that well. Oh, and they became an overnight oh, sensation, gosh, especially their pint-sized point guard, Morgan William, who hit the winning shot against oh, UConn. But, David, morning, for those everyone. who follow the women's game... South Carolina's 67-55 win last night was not a surprise. The Gamecocks were a number one seed. They'd already beaten Mississippi State twice this season, and under head coach Don Staley, they'd been building. Yeah, I don't think I'll get a game. Uh, right now. They first reached the Final Four two years ago. But the weirdest thing, Tom, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, Morgan William, the uh, the I'm star of Mississippi State. It. Didn't she spend most of the time on the bench in the fourth Sadly. quarter last night? What's going on? She did. It was weird. She had a rough night. She told reporters afterwards she wasn't That's bringing enough enough energy to her play. And her coach, Mick Schaefer, that echoed that. He said well, William compete. didn't have energy and reserve guard Jasmine you know, Holmes did, and that's why she played in Williams' place. 
But still, uh, it's curious to leave your best player on the bench that five. long at the most critical time. It was strange USN and painful ships. to see this happen it's to just this awful, player man. You who just was mobbed work harder. by teammates Friday night who became the out where darling to of the Final Four. Now, perhaps Williams' low energy was partly a UConn hangover, but do give credit to South Carolina's great defense, especially point guard Bianca Cuevas Moore, who absolutely got in Williams' face early and denied her the ball, just wouldn't I'm let Williams with my get CZ. the ball and run the offense the way she usually so does. Czechoslovakia well, let, let's pistol. get to the men's game. I mean, Gonzaga, first time ever in the championship. Beautiful North Carolina has been there like say. a million times. Does that mean North Carolina really has the advantage tonight? Well, the same guy. Uh, yeah, you, you know, Funny thing about this guy is he has, a one, one, has one. the history. Five championships, 24 um, out appearances. For but you know, of course, sure none of that up. matters when you're dribbling and shooting we'll and defending <laughs> right now in the upgrade. moment. What's going to matter to Gonzaga is limiting North Carolina's well, ability to Kaku, rebound so. the ball. The Tar Heels are one of the best at that. Be Gonzaga also has to get back It'll on defense interesting. and prevent North Carolina from running wild. North Carolina has to deal with two excellent Gonzaga seven footers and a tremendous guard in Nigel Williams Goss. They're similar teams, they both have size and speed and talented guards and depth. Pilot and play great defense. It'll be a fun game. Well, and Tom, North Carolina coming off that devastating last-second loss to Villanova Action last year. A lot of their fans probably wondering, when are we going to get back there and just just put that behind us? <laughs> and they get a chance now to do that. Uh, yeah, so th there's some extra motivation. You know, for Gonzaga, some different motivation, but it's still, you know, strong for them. It's about respect. Uh, Gonzaga has been to the tournament every year since 1999, but never this far. And the thinking always has been that they haven't been able to get this far because they don't play in one of the power conferences. You know, they don't they don't face the toughest competition. So Gonzaga would love to win this and show that a smaller school from far eastern Washington State can indeed compete with and beat the very best. Okay, NPR Sports correspondent Tom Goldman. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. You heard him on Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm David Green. And I'm Steve Inskey. I'm Carson Cooper, 849. This is WSF 89.7 here on this Monday, April 3rd. Great to have you aboard. Well, gas prices have been kind of holding steady in the Bay Area this past week. As of this morning, Steve, regular and lidded on average in Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater is 221 a gallon. Same as yesterday and same as already? last week. It was no. exactly two dollars on the nose. You probably fired a for no reason. One year ago, or more probably fired on news coming up on the marketplace Sticky morning report next it. on Morning Edition. Yeah. And in your car this morning, Dale Mabry at Van Dyke. There's a crash. Also, Fowler Avenue westbound at 56th Street, Pasco County U.S. 19 southbound Here's south of State Road 52. That's a trouble spot. And in Manatee County, it looks like two lanes well, are still one, blocked on the I-75 southbound. The right and center lanes. Uh, between 275 and University Parkway. Traffic comes to us from Total Traffic and the Ad Council. Support for WUSF comes from Florida wineries with 22 farm wineries throughout the state. Tasting, tours, and day trips showcase the history of the can do. Many can, local uh, supermarkets feature Florida wines. Information at tryfloridawine.com. America's biopharmaceutical uh, companies every day, 140,000 researchers across the country, it's including thousands yeah, in Florida, go like boldly into the unknown in search of tomorrow's breakthrough cures. The future of medicine for all of us at GoBoldly.com. Nice, there you go. Meet me in St. Louis, a place seeking what it means to be fair. St. Louisans are smart enough and kind enough to work across All the racial lines for economic justice and for racial justice. Healing voices from the city of the blues changed the tune nearly three years after the death of Michael Brown. Next time on The Takeaway from WNYC and PRI, Public Radio International. This afternoon at 3 on WSF 89.7. It's 8.51. Technology creates more and better jobs than it destroys, but what if it's different this time? Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Moo. Moo helps businesses, big, small, and somewhere in between, oh, stand out with premium business oh, cards, postcards, stickers, and more. This is you by Moo. Learn more at Moo.com. And by T. Rowe Price. Mm. Institutions, advisors, well, employers, and individuals choose T. Rowe Price to find global investment oh, opportunities the, for over 75 oh, years. T. Rowe Price. No invest go. with confidence. I say From again, Marketplace that's in New York, no I'm go. David Brancaccio. This is the week President Trump meets with the Chinese premier in Florida. 
A key topic beyond North Korea will be the U.S. administration pushing back against globalization. A central piece of the Trump agenda is to bring back jobs from overseas, but a very big challenge really? and opportunity for American jobs may be domestic, not foreign. It it's technology. Machines and algorithms are getting pretty good at doing parts or all of our this jobs. Is good. A this month here in Marketplace, I'll be looking at this in depth. Next week here, it's my week-long trip through the Midwest in search of what I'm calling robot-proof jobs, the careers that are robot-resistant or play well yeah, with technology. It. It. This morning, we'll kick off this what project a, with a conversation a with Martin Ford, futurist and author of the book one X5 Rise two. of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. Artificial intelligence and robotics really Does seem know to I'm be far kind of reaching the point <laughs> where, where we're really seeing an acceleration, a kind of an, what you might call an inflection point where things are really beginning to drive upward and it's going to have a huge impact across the board this is all oh, happening not burning. just because of technology but because oh, of the interaction God, of technology and on. the market there has always been a powerful incentive in capitalism to save our labor so you know, on, to, to do something more Stop. efficiently and Air. of course historically awesome. that's been a good it's thing off. that's what's made us richer it's you know i mean historically what we've seen is that technologies have had a big impact in one area really? of the economy for example think about what mechanization did to agriculture? Yeah, machines. Yes. Machines in the 19th century. Oh, oh three times flooding. That's oh, right. you're but done. There was one sector of the economy. Oh, you are so done. And that meant that the whole rest oh, of man. the economy was out there to absorb Hope you those got repairs workers. Ready. So, of course, people lost their jobs oh, on farms, gosh. but then they found jobs Let's in factories. Now, what we're going to see is more of a general purpose wave of technology almost like a utility Bro, you know, that's a lot of flooding three times artificial flooding. intelligence and information so technology when this hits 50 electricity 51 52, i mean you wouldn't ask you're gonna see some serious shit impacted by electricity we'll see if it I hits mean, that far the answer is obviously everything and you must see it all depends here. on how I mean, much uh if he has the premium damage control this. When it comes to national politics, the debate right fire. now is not but about you'll never know. robots and AI and algorithms. It's about trade. But it may be that it's the technology we should be spending a little bit more time focusing on in terms of the direction of, of yeah, uh, still the labor flooding. force. You know, technology is probably the most important force already. And, and the most important point that I would make is that that's going to become even more true in the future. It's going to, I think, really overwhelm the impact of of globalization. Um, in fact, you already see some factories coming back to the United States. Yeah, but what flooding. happens, of course, is that when the factory comes back to the U.S., it's almost entirely automated. Now, what we can say is that initially, too. the jobs that are most probably. likely to be impacted are those that are on some level routine and repetitive. If you're facing the same challenges, or if there, your job is even a little bit boring oh, he just healed. from day oh, to day, then, then you should be a little I've bit worried him. that Good. at some point technology that's is going to you know, reach the point where that's going to be threatened. Martin Ford's latest book is called Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. Mr. Ford, thank you for this. Thank you very much for having me. Now, tomorrow we'll meet a Marketplace listener who lost her job target. to an algorithm. Tweet Coco. your experience to us, hashtag RobotProofJobs. Plus, a week from now, the first part of our audio documentary, Exploring this gets released into our podcast streams, which we call it Botcast. Let's do the numbers. The FTSE in London is up five points. The Dow future up six points. The NASDAQ future up less than a tenth percent. The S&P future down slightly. Big car and truck companies today are set to reveal how sales went in the month just ended. We're expecting a big jump for several companies, but there's always a but. Here's Marketplace's Nancy Marshall Genzer. If you just look at the sales numbers, you might think the car industry is just as strong this year as it was a year ago. But Dave Sedgwick at Automotive News says... Check the engine. There's some blinking yellow lights on the dashboard, uh, and these are issues that have been festering for a while. For example, automakers' inventories have reached the highest levels in more than a decade, and dealers are offering more incentives to car buyers. Sedgwick also says dealers are making longer-term loans, lasting six, seven, or even eight years. He's worried that as cars age, those loans will be worth more than the car. They'll be upside down. If you're upside down on your loan and you want to buy a new car, that means you still owe money on the, the old car. And that makes it hard to buy a new one. Nancy, thank you.
Marketplace Morning Report is supported by the University of Massachusetts Lowell, extending learning beyond the classroom through social entrepreneurship, scientific field research, study abroad, and service learning. More at uml.edu slash hands-on. And by Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, working to unleash the immune system's power to fight cancer and develop promising new therapies. More at discovercarebelieve.org. And by HostGator. You can create a small business website with HostGator's drag-and-drop website builder. Learn more at HostGator.com slash marketplace. Coming to McDonald's, quarter pounders made from fresh, not frozen meat. You see, Wendy's and Shake Shack does this. Marketplace's Annie Baxter has one. Consumers are getting pickier about food quality these days, according to Molly Harnishfaker, a restaurant consultant with Alex Partners. 74% of consumers suggest that the quality of ingredients is the number one kind of influencer for them for value. The share of people who feel that way is rising, whereas the share focused on price is falling. Harnishfaker says that's the kind of thing that McDonald's is addressing with its move towards fresh beef patties over frozen ones in its quarter pounders. Using oh, fresh snaps. patties could mean shorter wait times for customers. This doesn't have to be tier 10. I didn't even faster, realize it. According to restaurant consultant Sweet. Eliana Barbara, but she says the change will spell challenges for franchisees. Barbara says low. frozen patties can store for several months, whereas you've got to cook fresh patties within a couple days. So you're I think they forgot. No. in a very short time for not only the product safety and also the quality. Yeah, so and if franchisees order too many patties, they'll waste more, driving up costs. Costs they could conceivably pass to consumers. Might, I'm Annie Baxter for Marketplace. And in New York, I'm David Brancaccio, and this is the Marketplace What's high Morning right Report. I forgot what high caliber is. From high APM, caliber, American Public one? Media. No. It is 8.59. <laughs> nope. This is WSF 89.7. The BBC News Hour is coming up next. Tom Shit, Ashbrook on point at 10 and fresh air today at noon. This one. Opera Tampa presents Destroy, Tosca at, at the Strath Center April 7th and 9th. Puccini's melodrama culminates in Tosca's mm. gripping battle to try to okay. save everything she believes in, art, love, and life itself. Tickets available at operatampa.org. The University of Tampa is holding a graduate program information session on April 20th. Current students, faculty, and staff will answer questions okay. and talk about the graduate programs. Learn more at ut.edu backslash grad visits. Breezy and kind of cloudy today, a 20% right. chance for showers, high 86, about the same for tomorrow. This is WUSF 89.7, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, broadcasting from the University of South Florida. Well, it's it's 9 o'clock. Whoop de doo It's 13 hours GMT, 4 p.m. in St. Petersburg, 9 a.m. on America's East Coast. Welcome to News Hour from the BBC World Service. I'm Paul Henley. Coming up, there's been at least one explosion on a train on the St. Petersburg metro system in Russia. We'll have the latest. Security, but not human rights, will be high on the agenda when President Trump meets his Egyptian counterpart. But what else does President Sisi want from the meeting? A declaration of support for President Sisi. It's very important. Donald Trump coming out, speaking to the media, saying that the U.S. is behind the President Sisi. Also on the program. It's just after midnight. And at a kitchen table in Bristol, a middle-aged man is cutting apostrophes out of sticky back plastic. We meet the apostrophe vigilante fighting grammar baddies wherever he finds them. That's all after the news. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Corva Coleman. Reports from Russian media say there has been a subway explosion in the western city of St. Petersburg. There are reports that 10 people were killed, according to Reuters News Agency, which cites the Russian National Anti-Terrorism Committee. Social media images are showing damage to subway cars. President Trump's son-in-law and a leading Trump advisor, Jared Kushner, is in Iraq meeting with military leaders. As NPR's Tamara Keith reports, this appears to be an expansion of Kushner's portfolio. 
White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer says Kushner is on the ground in Iraq. The U.S. and coalition partners invaded Iraq 14 years ago, and the U.S. is now aiding the Iraqi military as it battles Islamic State militants. President Trump has asked military leaders to develop a plan for intensifying U.S. efforts to defeat ISIS. Reuters, which has a reporter on the trip, reports Kushner and White House Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert were invited by Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joe Joseph Dunford to hear, quote, firsthand and unfiltered from military advisors on the ground. Kushner has also been tasked with liaising with the Mexican government, working to find peace in the Middle East, and leading an effort to modernize the U.S. government. Tamara Keith, NPR News. President Trump is preparing to host his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, at his resort in Palm Beach, Florida this week. NPR's Anthony Kuhn reports it's the first summit between the two leaders. Chinese state media quote Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and China's state councillor Yang Jiechi as saying that the summit at Mar-a-Lago will be crucial to the development of U.S.-China ties. Trump said in a Sunday interview with the Financial Times that if China doesn't help talk North Korea out of its nuclear ambitions, the U.S. may act unilaterally. NPR's Anthony Kuhn. Chicago police have arrested a 14-year-old boy in connection with the sexual assault of a 15-year-old girl streamed live on Facebook. Police say they expect to make more arrests. For member station WBEZ in Chicago, Lauren Chuljan reports. Police say at least 40 people watched the assault online and none of them called 911. Commander Brendan Dinahan says the victim is traumatized by what happened, but she's been helping with the investigation. Detectives working with the state's attorneys are, you know, did several interviews with this victim, but she's having a very, very difficult time even, even talking about it. So it took a little bit of, you know, took a little bit of time. Dinahan says the victim is being bullied on social media, which is making her feel worse. Officers also have an arrest warrant for another teenager who was involved in the incident. A spokesman for the family calls the assault a torture and says the family is totally shaken. For NPR News, I'm Lauren Chuljan in Chicago. The Senate Judiciary Committee convenes in an hour. Members are expected to approve the Supreme Court nomination of Neil Gorsuch. It is expected to be along party lines. Democrats are warning of a filibuster in the full Senate. This is NPR. Support for NPR comes from HostGator, where small business owners can create and manage websites with tools, templates, and 24-7 support. From providing basics for beginners to hosting high-traffic enterprise sites. More at HostGator.com slash NPR. It's 9.04. I'm Carson Cooper, WSF 89.7 News. Just about a month to go in Florida's 60-day legislative session, and both chambers have released their spending plans. As Nick Evans reports, they're about $2 billion apart. Three months ago, Florida Governor Rick Scott released his $83.5 billion spending plan. The House and Senate come in below that mark. At just over $81 billion, the House plan is a billion less than last year's budget. Miami Republican Representative Carlos Trujillo believes deep cuts are necessary. Our budget year, next fiscal year, we go from a $1.2 billion deficit to a one point, almost $1.1 billion surplus. And the out years, the year after, we go from a $1.8 billion deficit to a $1.3 billion surplus. Florida's general revenue fund is actually growing, but the state's precarious economic situation comes thanks in part to refusing additional federal Medicaid funding and habitual tax cutting. The Senate plan comes in at $83.1 billion, less than the governor's proposal, but still almost $2 billion more than the House. For Florida Public Radio, I'm Nick Evans in Tallahassee. The House has just approved a measure that will prevent sports franchises from building or renovating stadiums on land owned by the public. Part of an effort by House leaders to limit public assistance to private companies, the same argument used against Enterprise Florida, a companion bill has not yet emerged in the Senate. Breezy with a 20% chance for showers today, high 86. Cloudy tonight, same for tomorrow. It's 9.06. And welcome to News Hour from the BBC World Service, coming to you live Get from Rick. London. Get Paul Rick. Henry. <laughs> There's been news in the last hour yeah. of an explosion, at least one, on the St. Petersburg Metro. At least ten people have been killed. We'll hear live from Russia next. When Donald Trump met the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, in September, he called him a fantastic guy. 
So today, with President Sisi in Washington, D.C., will recent strains between the U.S. be eased and at what cost to human rights in Egypt? And if you like your sentences to make precise sense, you'll be delighted to meet this anonymous vigilante who corrects with his apostrophizer. It's probably about eight feet long. So this is a, a device that enables you to plant a, an apostrophe quite high up and get over any obstacles that might be there. That's coming later. First, there are reports of at least one explosion on a train carriage in the metro system in the Russian city yes. of St. Petersburg. The BBC's Sarah Rainsford is following developments from Moscow. What more do you know, Sarah? Well, we've just seen the latest statement on this, which is coming from the investigative committee here in Russia, and they've, uh, they're they talking about one explosion. They're saying that it happened uh, between the stations of Technologichsky Institut and, uh, I believe, Senaya Porsche, so two stations right in the center of St. Petersburg. But we understand Wait, one explosion. What? And oh the my investigative God, an explosion committee here says Russia. it was an unidentified explosive uh -oh. device. It says there are... Uh, oh people no. who've been killed and there are casualties there are people who've been injured too now we've heard from the governor's office in st petersburg who has talked about 50 people being injured and we've heard other sources uh, several sources quoted on news agencies here saying at least 10 people have been killed so an extremely serious incident yeah, uh, president putin good. has already spoken he said that uh, all uh, reasons for uh, this uh, this incident are currently being considered that the security forces are working to establish uh, why this has happened and he said that all reasons including terrorism and also potentially some kind of criminal cause are being considered uh, so uh, that's the statement from president putin as i say we're, we're not clear yet what exactly uh, was behind this or who was behind this but it looks like an explosive device went off on one train carriage uh, between two stations in the center of st petersburg does this come in a context of recent Dang, security threats in russia guys. amazing well, nothing specific, but I suppose a general background of a, a fairly oh uh, heightened uh, sense of, of security and potential like threat. Most of my uh, don't forget that uh, Russia has been carrying out airstrikes in Syria uh, for quite a long time now. Now, President Putin, when he began those strikes, Thank he said God that there was an anti-terrorism uh, operation. It was about uh, pre preventing oh uh, Russian-born uh, insurgents, Islamic Thank extremists who'd gone to Syria to fight there from coming home, and as he put it then, bringing that threat back to Russia, so ostensibly that was about an anti-terrorism operation, but of course uh, it always had the, the risk of potentially uh, um, radicalizing people here in Russia itself. Of course this is uh, assuming this is a terrorist attack and assuming that perhaps there is an Islamic extremist uh, linked to it. At the moment none of that is confirmed. There are all sorts of other possible explanations, uh, but certainly Russia is no stranger to terror attacks. There have been attacks on the Moscow metro, uh, which were claimed at the time back in 2000. 2010 uh, claimed by uh, extremists well, in Chechnya, um, the Islamic extremists in Chechnya, the, uh, the Muslim Republic of Russia. So uh, there have been attacks before. At the moment, though, we're trying to, to find out exactly what's happened in St. Petersburg. Sarah Rainsford, many thanks. We hope to talk to you again as more details emerge. Sarah Rainsford, our correspondent in Moscow. <laughs> President Obama never invited the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, to the White House. So President Sisi has had to wait until today for his first visit. He's due to discuss a number of bilateral issues with President Trump, including how to defeat the Islamic State group. Egypt, the most populous Arab country, has been America's strategic ally in the Middle East for nearly four decades. But Mr. Sisi's regime is accused by activists of committing severe human rights violations, including mass arrests, arbitrary detention, and forced disappearances. Critics fear the two leaders will turn their backs on the question of human rights, as both of them give priority to the so-called war on terror. The BBC's Sally Nabil reports now from Cairo. The American embassy in central Cairo is a sprawling, heavily guarded complex usually seen as a symbol of America's influence in Egypt. During the last four years, this influence was a source of tension. Relations had grown cold, with the Obama administration critical of Egypt's deteriorating human rights record and poor economic performance. But with Donald Trump in the White House, U.S.-Egyptian relations are expected to take a turn for the better. Well, I thought it was very productive. He's the... Uh 
fantastic guy. He took control of Egypt. A couple of months before his election, the Republican candidate met President Sisi in New York. He expressed strong support for the military-backed leader. It was a very good chemistry, good feeling between us. Donald Trump praised the Egyptian president's approach to battle Islamic militants who created havoc in other regional neighbors like Syria and Iraq. I'll tell you, he took control of the country. He's gotten the terrorists out and, you know, wiped them out. Jihadists have been operating in the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula for a few years. President Trump says he will make sure the U.S. military assistance to Egypt is effective in this regard. In July 2013, General Sisi toppled the democratically elected Islamist president, Mohamed Morsi. A few weeks later, Barack Obama partly suspended America's annual military aid package to Egypt, which is worth more than a billion dollars. But the suspension was lifted less than two years later. Safat Zayed, a military expert, expects the Egyptian president to highlight the issue of military support during his visit. The Egyptian arsenal heavily depends on the United States. It is the main arms supplier. There are also maintenance and training programs. All of this is indispensable. I believe Sisi will ask for more military hardware needed in the fight against terrorism, especially in Sinai. The Obama administration continued to supply Egypt with arms, but it also voiced deep concern at the alarming conditions of human rights under Abdel Fattah Sisi. Anti-regime protests like these held more than three years ago have been all but silenced due to tight legal restrictions and mass arrests. Local NGOs talk of tens of thousands of political prisoners, in addition to reports about torture in detention and forced disappearances. Gamal Aid is a founder of a prominent NGO. He is one of a number of activists banned from traveling. With Donald Trump in office, Aid is growing increasingly pessimistic. Unfortunately, the good relations between Trump and Sisi will encourage more human rights violations in Egypt. The Egyptian regime is now assured by the backing of a right-wing, almost racist administration in the U.S. Trump will give Sisi's regime a credibility it never enjoyed regarding human rights. Aid and other activists in Egypt expect the two leaders to focus on their shared views on combating Islamic radicalism. Questions of human rights are unlikely to be on their agenda when they meet at the White House. Sally Mabil reporting from the Egyptian capital there. Let's get a perspective on this meeting in Washington today. From a man who spent much of his career focusing on Egyptian politics, Eric Traeger is a fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's also author of Arab Fall, How the Muslim Brotherhood Won and Lost Egypt in 891 Days. So how important is it for Egypt and the U.S. to maintain a good relationship? Well, the U.S.-Egypt relationship is uh, important for the United States because the United States depends on Egypt for uh, maintaining the peace treaty with Israel, which is vital for regional peace, for cooperation on counterterrorism, especially since Egypt is facing ISIS affiliates in both the Sinai and coming over from Libya in the western desert. And, of course, it counts on Egypt for foreign access to the Suez Canal and overflight rights so that the U.S. can supply its base in the Persian Gulf for containing Iran and fighting ISIS. So, turning to this meeting today, we're often told that Mr. Trump is a blunt negotiator. What will he be looking for? Well, I think he's going to want to reset the relationship first and foremost. This is a relationship that uh, was damaged during the previous, really, six years under the Obama administration uh, because of the way in which, frankly, the Obama administration interpreted and responded to domestic political events within Egypt. Uh, this administration is going to take a different tack rather than getting uh, involved in Middle Eastern countries' domestic politics. It's going to focus on top-level strategic relations. 
on the assumption that this provides a way for, for cooperating and moving forward. So it's possible, is it, that human rights won't be mentioned at all? Well, I think they're going to raise certain human rights issues. They may raise the issue of Ayat Aghazi, who is an American citizen who's been detained arbitrarily. Wouldn't surprise me if they raise the case of the American NGO workers who were convicted in Egypt in 2013. You know, they may well, in other words, mention those incidents that involve U.S. citizens because those things are narrowly connected to U.S. interests. But in terms of pushing for broader transformative change in Egypt's domestic politics, it's coming off of two administrations that have tried to do this and failed. And one thing the current administration has learned is that there's just no upside to getting involved in other countries' domestic politics. As for what President Sisi wants from President Trump, we heard one expert in that report say approval. Is that it? That's a big part of it. Um, he wants that big hug that he felt he was denied under the Obama administration. But he's going to come with a long wish list. He's going to want more military aid, more economic aid. In recent weeks, Egyptian officials have floated uh, figures for economic aid that, in my conversation with one U.S. official, was referred to as an aid package of absurd proportions. So he's going to basically be asking for more money. And frankly, this is where I think the rubber is going to hit the road, because while the two leaders certainly share a priority in counterterrorism, uh, you know, Wow, Agent, you bully man. I'm witnessing all of this. I'm witnessing this. And because I've just seen it come through, US Donald, uh, USS Donald J. Trump, thanks for the host, buddy. How was the stream? Stop bullying him. I wouldn't say there, there, there is an alert somewhere five minutes behind. Black bar on your app. What? 